Um, and then I think next we'll have uh, Simon. Uh, you're online, right? Yes. Yeah, I am. Yep. Okay, so I'm uh, excited to in, you'll have Simon uh, up next. Um, uh, Simons is a principal scientist at Argo and an associate research professor at RAI at uh, CMU. He's part of the uh, computer vision group. Uh, he, um, before that, he was at uh, CISRO for five years and he got his PhD from Queensland University of Technology in 2003. And uh, uh, so looking forward to your talk. And I guess you're on campus already. Yes, I'm, I've decided to set up camp here in, in the cut. So yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, so I've, I've told everyone to freeze behind me. So it's very, very polite of everyone. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, thanks so much, Basti, for um, the intro. Um, I actually recorded my talk beforehand, but I can, I can just give it live. It might just be easier to, to, to do yeah, it Yeah, we get another iteration of practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so just let me bring that up now. And um, we can we can start. Um, here we go. Share. And so we're running about nine minutes behind. Yep, no problem. Is that? Can you see that, Basti? Yes. Great. Okay. All right. So thanks. Thanks so much for the intro. Um, and I'll try to kind of keep this short and sweet so people can go have their lunches or teas or coffees and things like that. Um, so, um, yeah, so the topic of this workshop is fantastic. I think it's sort of touching upon all things of SLAM, deep learning, um, geometry, um, all these wonderful things that are sort of exciting in the world of robotics and computer vision and learning at the moment. So one thing I'm going to talk about today, we're, we're doing a lot of work in this space in a number of different problems in my lab, but one thing in particular I want to talk to today is about doing geometric reasoning using learning algorithms where we only have 2D supervision. And um, I'm noticing there's a, a couple of people working on this now, but I'm going to define what I mean by 2D supervision um, and we can kind of go from there. So essentially, say like one problem that I'm really interested in is problems associated with autonomous cars. Um, so you have an autonomous car, it's driving down the street. And what's really important is it needs to have a good understanding of the other vehicles coming towards it. So it wants to know sort of the 3D position of those vehicles coming towards it and the 3D spatial extent of those vehicles. And so obviously there's a couple of different ways to solve this problem. Probably the most um, obvious way is through hardware. And um, we kind of see a lot of these autonomous cars um, driving around various cities here in North America and Europe um, and in Asia as well. And what we oftentimes see is this sort of little device on top of the car, a lighter, and it's shooting out um, lasers and using time of flight to determine depth. And um, it's really good, it's really, really useful. And people are doing a lot of work now on these lighter sensors. They have some drawbacks, but um, so one primary drawback is the um, density of the LiDAR returns as a function of distance. So the further out a vehicle is or an object is, the harder it is to see with the LiDAR because you just don't get that density of hits. Um, other issues are so like black bodies. So the black bodies, um, LiDAR really struggles with. Glass reflectance um, and also inclement weather can really affect um, this um, whole pipeline. So increasingly, we're kind of turning to deep learning to help us. And so um, we're like many problems in robotics and, and um, vision. And so one thing we've been turning to is actually, let's go back to just visible cameras. So on a, an autonomous car, you'll have like a ring camera around the, around, around the car, and you can get very dense measurements. But obviously the drawback to this type of measurement is that it's lacking any sort of 3D measurement. Um, so it's obviously a projection from 3D down to 2D and you're only really capturing the reflectance of light, not the depth of the object. So one thing we like to do is we like to basically come and essentially run this through a deep network. So we'll go and take our image, we'll run it through a deep network and what we'll spit back out is the six degree of freedom of the object with respect to its um, coordinate, coordinate frame. And also will output um, the 3D spatial structure. 
And when I mean the 3D spatial structure here, I'm not talking about dense. Um, so I'm actually talking about a core set of points, say a core set of points that are common to that object category, say car, table, chair. Um, I'm keeping the CAD model there so you can kind of interpret what the points are. And we are indeed doing things in dense reconstruction too. But here we're just talking about sort of getting the, the coarse 3D structure as well as the six degree of freedom network. And obviously this should be something simple that deep learning would be really good at, um, provided that we give it enough labels. And therein is the rub, how to provide enough 3D labels to train such a system. And it turns out that this is really, really hard to do. It's tedious and difficult. Um, so here's an example from the Beyond Pascal benchmark at a Silvio Savarisi's group. And you can kind of have a visualization here of what they do. They go through and they have to, you get an image, you have to go through a dictionary of CAD models, choose what CAD model you think is in the image. And then you go through this laborious um, task of determining whether points are occluded, where they're located. And it's a very onerous and error prone task. So it's, so it's a hard thing to do. Um, and so kind of to express this more formally, what we're trying to do with 3D supervision is we not only label the image, so we label the image with these 2D landmarks, and that's what we call, that we're going to call on here in 2D supervision. But what we're also trying to do is we're sort of trying to associate these 2D landmarks with 3D shapes from a dictionary. And so for instance, like we select one here, and then through simple PNP, we can then recover the six degrees of freedom such that we now have our 3D labels. And this is basically how it's done. Um, if you want to do it with real world images, um, obviously you can do this with synthetic rendering, but you then have this render gap between real images and synthetic images. And so that's oftentimes not a great idea. So doing this with real images is, is, is really important. So, and if we're doing this all correctly, then the theta, the six degrees of freedom that we're estimating should then basically match the 2D projections. So we're kind of arguing that this is not a good idea. And this is not a good idea for a couple of reasons. One major reason is that for specific object categories, say car, but many other object categories, the type of variation we see in the image is perhaps not gonna match the variation of shapes we have offline. So that's really hard to do and anticipate beforehand. Um, the other thing too is, so obviously like many of you, I love driving around town using a, a stretch SUV, something that um, I enjoy to do, a very, very common thing. Um, but this is sort of an extreme example of this instance, but, but it does come up, especially when you sort of branch out to many, many different object categories where you perhaps don't have really good 3D shapes to use. So, the question sort of we've been exploring in my group is how far can you go with just 2D supervision? If you've just got the 2D labels in the imagery, how far can you go? And that's sort of the, the topic for today's talk. So what we've been exploring is, and so if we kind of do a good job on that, um, we could perhaps go and just basically get this type of labeling and then infer all that 3D structure. And um, this image is actually taken from the Apollo car 3D um, data set, um, it's a, a paper and a data set that was released at CVPR 2019. So could we just use these types of 2D labels to automatically lift out the 3D structure um, from this type of 2D supervision? So let's set up the problem more formally. So what the problem kind of looks like is we have our landmarks, our 2D landmarks, and we have a bunch of images, perhaps millions of images. And we are gonna assume that all the images come from the same object category. So it could be chair, could be car, could be table, um, any type of object category we like. And what we're trying to do is we want to basically lift out this 3D structure. And the only supervision we have is the 2D labels, but the extra constraint we have is that we have lots and lots of them. So lots and lots of them stemming from the same object category. So rather than just one image, we have many, many, many images stemming from that same object category. Now, um, some people in the vision and robotics community are referring to this as unsupervised 3D lifting. And so this is a, a term that um, uh, uh, from Jim Regg's group uh, at the, from their CVPR 2019 paper. Um, another term that we kind of like to use is something called structure from categories. So that's something that we're, we're trying to kind of um, get the community to perhaps use. Um, again, um, it's um, tomato, tomato, same principle. You're trying to kind of lift the 3D structure out from the 2D labels. And um, it's very much related to the problem of structure for motion. In particular, 
um, non-rigid structure for motion. So that may seem, seem weird to many listeners and saying, well, how can a chair be non-rigid? Well, uh, the instance of chair is obviously rigid. So I've got a, a rigid object like a chair or a vehicle, um, it's rigid. But the object category chair is non-rigid. So chairs can have many different shapes and forms. And so what's cool with that is that we can then bring to bear all the excellent work that's been done in non-rigid structure for motion to this problem. So let's kind of formalize the problem a bit more. So what we're wanting to recover is X, Y, and Z for the ith index in our 3D structure. And what we have is U and V, just the 2D projection. So probably annotated by a uh, human. And we are relating these th this 3D um, unknown 3D coordinate to the known 2D coordinate through a camera projection. And basically it can be um, a perspective or an affine camera, and it's related by six degrees of freedom. And so obviously I can concatenate all my points together, P points into a matrix, which is P by two. And obviously the unknown 3D structure then is a P by three matrix. And I'm trying to then basically have my, the, the two things that are unknown are the 3D structure and the camera. And the thing that is known is the 2D correspondences. And obviously for each image, we have a number of unknowns. So 3P plus six. So the six is there because of six degrees of freedom, but we only have two P knowns. So this is obviously a heavily under-constrained problem. So what to do? So one simple thing to do here is basically to constrain the problem. And an obvious thing to constrain is that, all right, well, we, we know that our camera matrices have to be SE3. Um, so that's something useful, but it's not that useful. It's definitely a useful constraint, but it's not terribly useful when it comes to this non-rigid structure promotion problem. Something that's even that's perhaps more important is if we can actually constrain S, the unknown 3D structure. And so we want to constrain S to lie in a space omega that is somehow constraining this problem. And so the big question that we've been asking my group is, could we somehow learn Omega? So we could do a good job of this for different types of object categories. But when we're learning Omega, we only can learn from the 2D correspondences. We can't have some offline 3D data set to learn from. We only have the 2D correspondences. So it turns out that there's a couple of different ways to attack this. Um, so one way to attack this is basically to get our 3D structure, so our P by three matrix, and simply vectorize that matrix. So we have a three P by one vector. And a very, very simple idea is to assume that for that object category, this 3D shape lies in a low dimensional linear subspace. So we can kind of see here and we can visualize this sort of simply, um, and we refer to this as our low rank shape prior. And we can visualize this instead of the um, D1, D2, and D3 are our dictionary vectors, and B1, B2, B3 are our unknown coefficients. And so we can kind of visualize this in sort of matrix form that makes things a bit, a bit simpler. And this idea was made um, popular um, originally through a quite famous paper by Chris Bregler um, back at CVPR 2000. And um, in follow-up work, um, probably quite a famous paper from Hong Dong Lee's group at CVPR 2012, kind of demonstrated how um, you could use convex relaxations to optimize this easily to determine the rank. So using trace norm and things. And I, and I, I believe that paper won best paper at CVPR 2012. So um, some neat work in that space. So let's apply this idea to 3D lifting. And we've got an example here of applying it to um, the object category chair. And unfortunately, it does not do a great job. And one of the reasons it doesn't do a great job is for many objects that we're interested in nowadays, the amount of shape variation we have to deal with is substantial. And so the low rank assumption is poor in that regard because we can't handle large amounts of 3D shape variation for an object category. So, um, but what we're trying to kind of argue here is actually we have made a bit of a breakthrough recently in our lab. Um, something that was presented at ICCV 2019, something that we call deep non-rigid structure for motion, which is able to do a really good job 
at this type of 3D lifting for a number of different object categories. And we're gonna kind of walk through now how we do that. But if, if you kind of turn off after this, this is the main result. We can actually do a really good job now of just working with 2D labels and lifting out this 3D structure and camera position. So how do we do this? Well, the central idea comes from the realization that if we wanna model more 3D shape variation, we need to add more columns to the matrix D. So this seems kind of obvious, um, but problematically, if we add more columns to D, it makes it overcomplete. And so um, we need to then add an extra constraint to the B vector to make it unique. And so a common constraint is essentially sparsity, okay? So we try to enforce sparsity to make things unique. And in fact, um, our lab sort of pioneered some work in this space, something that we call compressible structure for motion. And um, it actually works really nicely. It's theoretically very elegant, but there's an issue. One of the issues is if you encounter more and more shape variation, you need to make your D matrix have more and more columns. And as you add more and more columns, you get this really kind of problematic issue of essentially having to have the column vectors get closer and closer together. And because they're closer and closer together, that can form instability, okay? So we can actually get, so if there's annotation noise or other types of confusion, it can get confused over which dictionary element should be active and not active. And so that can make the, make the reconstruction or the lifting process very, very noise sensitive, which is something that we don't want because you've got people there clicking on points and there will be noise. So what to do? So one thing that we've sort of been exploring is intuitively, we've sort of noticed that, well, if you wanna have your system more robust, you want less columns. You kinda of want your D matrix to be more square, right? So more square, the number of columns and rows to be about the same. If I wanna be able to model more shape variation, I wanna make D more rectangular. I actually wanna kinda of make it more rectangular, adding more elements in there. But that comes at the drawback of making it less robust. And in fact, I've got a little bit of a, um, an advertisement here. We are exploring um, this connection actually generally with respect to deep learning in an in a oral we have here at CBPR. So if you're interested in sort of this trade-off um, in a more general sense, I'd encourage you to kind of come check out that paper um, that's gonna be happening this week. So we've got this trade-off. And so the question that we've been asking ourselves is, can we do better? We want to be able to be robust, but model a lot of shape variation. So what could we possibly do? And so one idea that's sort of interesting here is the idea of employing what we refer to as a hierarchical sparse shape prior. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We basically wanna make D artificially more square. So how do we do that? Well, one really simple way of doing that is to actually synthetically or artificially add zeros to S, so make S longer. Okay, and so by making S artificially longer, we make D more square. So we're not actually reducing the number of columns. We can still have a lot of columns, but we just add more zeros to the bottom to make it more square. And sort of basically what this does intuitively is you can actually think of, um, this is actually allowing the dictionary to spread out in more dimensions. So that if in a lower dimension, two dictionary elements are close together, by adding extra dimensions, it gives you more opportunity to kind of spread them out to make the reconstruction more robust, but also allowing you to have extra capacity to model shape variation. Now, this seems like a bit of a parlor trick, but what's really cool is um, recently there was um, a couple of neat papers put out by Michael Elad's group, um, a very well-known guy in sort of sparse coding and signal systems showing that there's actually a direct connection between the problem of sparse coding and a single layer of a neural network using ReLU, so a feedforward network. And you can actually show that a feedforward neural network using ReLU can approximate the sparse coding problem. And so what's more interesting is that if we include our hierarchical sparse prior, so kind of adding this element, it's equivalent if we structure things properly to adding layers to a deep network. And so this approximation can hold under certain circumstances. And so as I make my D more and more square, as I add more and more capacity, it actually can be com computationally 
um, efficiently realized as a feed-forward neural network. And if you're interested in the details of this, and again, the details of this will be sort of in our up, up and coming oral, but this is a core insight that we utilize for our 3D lifting process, because then we can kind of jump backwards and forwards between treating the 3D lifting process as a factorization problem and actually implementing it um, efficiently using modern deep learning um, frameworks. So what's neat there then is we can actually essentially set up the problem as this sort of 3D lifting autoencoder. So the 3D lifting autoencoder kind of runs through and it kind of projects through to these different layers, D1, D2, D3. And D1, D2, D3 are actually sub matrices of the larger matrix D. And um, if we factor things properly, we can then actually separate out the six degrees of freedom through the autoencoder. So we, in an unsupervised way, just like we do in regular structure for motion, split out the six degrees of freedom from the 3D structure. So we can then basically recover the 3D structure. And um, again, if you're interested in the details in this, um, we, um, it's up on our paper, um, Deep Non-Rigid Structure for Motion, which was published in ICCV 2019. And, um, but what I'm gonna advertise for you guys are the results. So what we did in this paper is we compared um, our approach to all the known approaches at the time of publication for non-rigid structure for motion. And so we did this on the IKEA data set and had different object categories, say bed, chair, sofa, table. And the main thing to pay attention to is basically the error rates here on the y-axis. And the error rates here are in logarithmic scale, okay? So, um, and so what's interesting is our approach not only outperformed all the, uh, these other techniques, it out outperformed them by an order of magnitude. So not just slightly, by a dramatic amount. And so what's really cool here is it really opens up the opportunity to apply structure for motion techniques to these 3D lifting problems where you couldn't do it before because of the inability of the techniques to handle um, large amounts of shape variation. What's also neat too, so this is an example of ours versus sort of the closest competitor. What's also really neat too here is that our approach can handle large amounts of annotation noise. So what we have here is our approach um, on the yellow line here in terms of error. And then the black line here is the lowest error made by, base, by baselines that compared against without noise. And we're substantially better, even in the presence of, of large amounts of noise, which is important because you will have human annotators clicking on points and they will make mistakes. They will not be reliable. Finally, um, in any type of 3D lifting process, um, there will be self-occluded points. So chairs, vehicles, there'll be lots of points that you will not be able to see. So our approach is also, because it's based on factorization, easily able to handle large amounts of missing points. And again, when we compare our approach to the next kind of um, best method at the, time, at, at, at the time when this was released, um, we were able to kind of outperform them dramatically even when those methods had no missing points. So the x-axis here is determining the number of points that were missing. Um, and then finally, um, we have some examples here of um, reconstructions. Hang on, we can split that out of this part, sorry. Um, so here we, here we have um, some real world image reconstructions. So we have sort of the reconstruction of the object category plane, just from 2D annotated um, points. We have reconstructions of the object category um, bike. Again, the red points are what you should pay attention to. The white here is used to kind of make sure that the red points have some sort of semantic meaning. Um, and then also what we've done is actually we've extended this framework now, and this is an archive paper that we recently released that is now able to um, handle perspective geometry. So we can do a really good job now on say, things like the Apollo car 3D data set where um, human annotators are going through and just clicking on points and a lot of points are occluded. And we can do a really good job now on just being able to kind of reconstruct these things um, really, really accurately. Um, and um, and our, convention, our older method wasn't able to handle the perspective geometry as well. So our new method is able to do a really good job on this. We also have some really neat results um, for other types of data. So the on the human 3.6 million um, data set. Here we've got reconstructions 
um, and we're using no time information here. Okay, so um, it's um, we're just using it for the object category body, and obviously there's a lot of techniques out there now for three D lifting, but ours is completely generic. It uses no time, and we're actually able to get very good results. And what's also kind of cool is we're able to compare our method um, against um, a number of really recent techniques. So there's uh, another 3D lifting technique that's become quite popular now. And it was released just late last year. It's called C3 DPO. Um, and it's from um, Adrava Dali's um, group at Oxford. And um, that approach actually works pretty well. But our latest work is that are actually able to kind of overcome some of the um, poor reconstructions that they're seeing in their approach. So um, we're really excited about what this approach can do. Um, we've also got other results on um, more general object categories. So Pascal 3D, um, here's an example. We've got occluded points. Um, we're actually able to do a really good job on this for chairs. And also for buses. And obviously there's some limitations. So one of the limitations is that um, because we're not using any temporal information, it's all kind of just because um, um, there's no structure oftentimes to um, these data sets in time, um, we are oftentimes not able to handle um, inherent ambiguities, so like whether our hands forward or backward, that, that's something that there would be an ambiguity over. Um, and we've actually got some work where we, we're using appearance to kind of condition on that, to try to kind of overcome this issue. Um, and another thing is there is sometimes confusion between deformation and um, perspective effects when, when the data set is limited. So um, essentially in summary, um, what I've been able to kind of show here is we've presented a new approach for 3D lifting that uses only 2D supervision. So hopefully you guys have got a better sense of what we mean by 2D supervision. Um, we're actively pursuing strategies where this theoretical connection between sparse coding and deep learning can be leveraged. Um, and so another advertisement is we've got a, a paper here at CVPR where we're actually able to show when you, you, can, you can use sparse coding to solve inversion problems that CNNs can't do a good job on. So I'd encourage you guys to maybe check that out if you're, if you're attending the conference. And um, we're also able to show how 3D lifting can help train appearance detectors to handle geometric ambiguity. So it was something that we presented at ICC, ICCB 2019. And we are actively, like a lot of other groups around the world, working on how to um, leverage some of these results for dense 3D lifting using only 2D supervision. So instead of perhaps landmarks, if you have 2D silhouettes plus landmarks, can we lift out the dense 3D geometry without any other 3D supervision? So um, that's about it for me for now. Um, so hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions. And again, thank you so much for the invitation. Kev. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that was a, a very uh, exciting uh, uh, talk. And uh, I think it's very interesting to see this 3D, 2D connection. And then, um, so I think, uh, so one question we have from the audience is, uh, if you uh, have compared the learned omega with the pin, pinhole projection fun, uh, model, um, so yeah, so the omega, um, so the omega we're referring to there is basically the constraint on the three D structure. So once we have the three D structure, we then project it. We can project it through with a pinhole camera or a perspective camera. So it's really about basically the constraint on the three D structure. So and a classic constraint, like um, I was saying earlier, is say the three D structure has low rank. That's like a classic one. Um, and um, some of, the, some of the, the more recent work now is sort of, instead of low rank, let's model this as a, an autoencoder or model it using sparse coding. Um, but the trick here is that you don't have the 3D data to learn the Amiga. You can only have the 2D projections. So you've got to factor in the camera when you're doing that, that Omega learning. And that's, that's really what makes this hard. Otherwise, if you had the 3D data, you could just sort of go through and have at it with your, with your, with your favorite sort of manifold learning technique. Okay, uh, let's see, do we have any other question? Um, uh, let's see, so I think one uh, question uh, that uh, I was thinking about is, 
So, uh, so when when you do this variation on the three D structure, I think you showed that uh, before to try to gener generalize it. So this is a certain uh, model. Uh, so you so you're trying to actually fit a more robust and general model by doing that, right? Like I think you showed that. Yes. So um, are you are you referring to kind of like the, like making are you referring to kind of like making the matrix more square? Is that is that yeah, what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah. But, yeah. So um, and and this is something that we've been thinking a lot about. So um, um, yeah. So essentially, in all these systems, a really simple way to think about it is you can model more shape variation if you add more column vectors to your D. And and so D is that dictionary. So you can model more 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 shape variation. But the drawback is, and the classic example is say a nearest neighbor classifier, for instance. If you have nearest neighbor, if things start getting really, really close together, you can easily confuse between which one you're gonna be using because they're too close together. And so what's neat here is it gives you, and so for a long time, 3D lifting literature has been held back by this. So they've always said, well, we need it to be robust. So we're gonna be low rank. So low rank intrinsically means that you can't model a lot of shape variation. So the neat insight here is that if you sort of artificially sort of append zeros to your shape, and again, because of the lack of time, we couldn't get into sort of the mathematical motivations here, but what it allows you to do is to make your D more square. And because it's more square, you can still kind of model all this shape variation, but you are separated out a lot better in this high dimensional space. And so, and what's really elegant too, is that for sparse coding, this can be cumbersome to solve, but because of this theoret theoretical connection, we can approximate this well using um, just a deep network. And so actually when we actually solve this, um, it can be done really efficiently, say in PyTorch or TensorFlow, and it literally is just sort of an unsupervised autoencoder. And, um, but we have some special components in there for separating out the camera components from the other components. And, um, but, what I think is interesting here with the square matrix is it gives a motivation for why does it work so well? Why is it so robust to noise and yet able to handle the shape variation? And so that's one thing sort of um, our group has been sort of latching onto. So sort of like, well, why does this work so well? And so we think this is a good theoretical explanation for why. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, we have a maybe slightly more general question is like, uh, how do you overcome snow and rainy situations for autonomous driving? So um, that's a good question. And, and again, that's sort of like why we've been investing um, um, a bit of um, time in this research direction, because um, as probably the person asking the question is sort of alluding to is that when you rely on sensors like um, LiDAR, um, they almost basically shut down in the presence of sort of um, snow and rain. And so again, cameras can do, um, visible cameras can do um, a lot better in those circumstances. Um, obviously, they do suffer from deterioration as well, but that's why um, we think these 3D lifting techniques um, are sort of so important because you can actually kind of at least label up a lot of data, 2D image data in these conditions, make detectors sort of do a good job in reconstructing um, the 3D position just from the 2D, 2D input. Um, there are obviously issues. Um, no sensor has um, uh, is impervious to problems. Obviously, kind of um, visible cameras have issue in low light um, at night. Um, so um, I do believe fundamentally any solution in the sort of practical sense there will have to be a multimodal solution. Um, but that's why we're sort of um, um, trying to push so heavily in this type of direction because um, we, we need to be utilizing other sensors other than LiDAR. Okay, thank you, Simon. No problem. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I think it's been a quite exciting talk so uh, talk, and also exciting workshop so far. And uh, so, I think uh, the plan right now is that we'll take a break right now till uh, one p.m. Pacific time, four p.m. Eastern time, and uh, ten. 10 p.m. Central European Standard Time or 4 a.m. Uh, Beijing time. <laughs> and so, so uh, if you're from the, uh, 
the part of the world where the times are essentially 12 hours opposite for like Australia or China or Japan, this is pretty tough. Um, but uh, so thanks everybody for, for, you know, kind of staying up or, you know, dialing in for wherever you are. Um, and um, so we'll be back at that time uh, with an invited uh, talk by uh, Thomas uh, and then uh, some contributed papers and then a couple more uh, uh, in invited uh, talks. And uh, so thanks everybody for you know, being on, on Zoom and for being on YouTube and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.